the next next contribution is uh, about a propagation path analysis on the HF bands using SDR and FST4W. And our speakers are um, Gwyn Griffith, G3 uh, Zulu India Lima, and Nigel Scrip, G4 Hotel Zulu X-Ray. Please give our speaker a warm welcome. So you're, you're going to present alone, right? Uh, yes, okay. I'm afraid uh, I've been forced to present alone. My colleague will answer any questions that I can't answer, which will be most of them. Okay. <laughs> so, Are you good? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, very good morning to everybody. And um, basically, I'm going to talk about magic <laughs> because propagation analysis is magic. Propagation is a subject which, whilst we all talk about it, and we talk about bands being open and bands being closed, things like that, really, we don't know very much about it. And we've had very limited amounts of information about this. And we've been working with software-defined radio and uh, the FST4W protocol to get some more information and some more ideas on what we can do with uh, anal analyzing propagation. So let's just have a quick look about HF propagation. What, what's going on? Well, you might have asked these questions to yourself. I can hear, I can hear somebody very close to me, um, but I'm, not, I'm too close uh, to him to be heard on ground wave. It's, or I'm too far away for ground wave. How, why am I hearing this person? Because I'm only 100 kilometers away from them. It really shouldn't be happening most of the time. So why can I do that? Why have I got a wonderfully good signal today, transatlantic, when normally I don't get that? Um, why was there a big gap in the reception to a particular place in the world? And I can't perhaps decode somebody um, in the north uh, far in the north, and um, why can't I do that? Was it a geomagnetic storm? Well, what we've been looking at is using SDR equipment, but running the FTS4W protocol to try to start to answer these questions. I will um, emphasize this, to try to start to answer the questions. We're not able to provide all the answers uh, at the moment. Let's just have a quick refresher on propagation. Um, we all talk about E layers and F layers um, and D layer even, um, but just very quickly, what have we got here? Well, we've got um, layers, the ionosphere, two main layers, the E layer and the F layer. During the day, we, these split, the F layer splits into the F1 and the F2 layer, uh, and the E layer splits into a D layer and the main E layer. At night, this coalesces basically into two layers, the, just the E layer and the F layer. So we are de de very dependent upon the position uh, of the sun to you. So wh whether it's daytime, nighttime, we know all this. We, we're well aware of how this, how this works. But just to look at that in that detail. And we talk about the maximum usable frequency. Now, it's interesting. There's two maximum usable frequencies. There's an E-layer muff, and there's also an F-layer muff. The E-layer muff is actually quite, low free, quite a low frequency. And typically, the E-layer maximum usable frequency is going to be in the region of 2.5 to 3 megahertz. So we've got a quite a low frequency uh, maximum usable frequ frequency. And the maximum hop distances we can get on this is up to about a thousand kilometers, depending on the angle of radiation from your antenna. And again, this is, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the converted because we all know that the incidence angle, the radiation angle, is very important. Low angle radiation is extremely important from your um, antenna. 
Um, if we look at the F layer maximum usable frequency, we actually can go quite a lot further on a single hop, typically 2,500 to 3,000 kilometers, depends upon the height of the F layer. Um, but these layers are very important. Now, when we look at this, what's happening is the uh, frequency, the maximum usable frequency on the F layer is a lot higher than the maximum usable frequency on the E layer because we start to go through the E layer, straight through the E layer, and into the F layer where the reflection actually, or the refraction actually happens. And so we've got a much higher frequency um, <laughs> to, before we start getting refraction at the and per, per, uh, going through the uh, F layer. Now these layers in the ionosphere are moving all the time. Don't think, ever think that the ionosphere is stable. It isn't. It goes up, it goes down. We get vertical movement at all times. We get horizontal movement of electron density. We get vertical movement within the uh, ionosphere, within a layer of electron density. So within particular bands of the ionosphere, we are getting different ca characteristics. So the ionosphere is in, it's moving all the time. It is a complete mess, actually. <laughs> and this mess accounts for the fact that we don't really know what is happening. We can only take very limited samples with today's technology. And one of the things that we're looking at with the techniques that I'm just about to describe is the ability to get some more information as to what is really happening inside the ionosphere. So we have all these changes going on. And what, what happens with these changes? Well, they give rise to Doppler shifts. If I'm going to hit an incident signal on something which is moving, the reflected signal will have a Doppler shift on it. We all know about Doppler shifts. The uh, trains passing you, it's exactly that, we're going to get a frequency change. Now, depending whether the ionosphere is going up or down, we will get a positive or a negative Doppler shift. Depends on if the electron density is changing, we can get positive or negative Doppler shifts. So rather than just talk about Doppler shift, I like to talk about Doppler spread, the, the actual smearing of the signal, uh, to give, which will come out. From these changes in the ionosphere, you're going to get a significant, small but significant spectral spread on a signal. And it's, we're using SDR receivers and SDR transmitters, actually, um, together with, some, uh, with FTS4W protocol to look at these spectral spreads. There's actually two sources, though, of spectral spread. The ionospheric spectral spread, but also the reflect reflected. If you go into multi-hop signals, you will get spectral spread from the multi-hop itself. Because where you are reflecting from the Earth, from the ocean, from mountains, you will get multiple paths. And those multiple paths themselves will involve different spectral spreads. So you will get a, a, a broadening of your spread on a multi-path, multi-hop signal. And one of the interesting things is by looking at spectral spread, we can start seeing how many hops our signal has actually taken to get from one point to another point. And using spectral spread, we can distinguish between ground wave, sky wave propagation, single hop, multi hop, multi hop with, with ground reflection, multi hop with intra ionospheric um, propagation. So going into one layer in the um, ionosphere and bouncing along inside the ionosphere. Sometimes this is called a ducting or a caudal uh, mode. Um, of propagation, but these multi-hop is quite an, quite an interesting look. And then we get into 
multi-hop backscatter and side scatter, which again are interesting and relatively undocumented for ham radio at least modes of propagation. So that's what we're going to be looking at. There's a few technical challenges that we've been facing, however. Just let's look at spectral spread. If we're talking about spectral spread, um, what are we actually talking about? Well, of course, a signal always has a bandwidth. And the, if it's got a bandwidth, we have to decide which bit of the band, how much power of that signal we're going to be using to measure our spectral spread. And if we, by convention with FTS4W, we actually take the 50% of the signal with tw on the curve of the signal, 25% at one side, 75% at the other side. So the central 50% of the signal gives us our of power received, gives us our spectral spread. Um, do all HF signals have spectral spread? Well, the answer is, um, unless you're receiving by ground wave, yes. Anything you receive that isn't a ground wave, there will be some degree of spectral spread on it. Um, now, why don't we necessarily see some of this spectral spread? Well, that's because spectral spread is in the order of tens or hundreds of millihertz. And we're going to see this um, in, my, in the presentation, and it's in our paper, M hertz. And we don't mean megahertz, we mean millihertz, a thousandth of a hertz. <laughs> and so that's quite important, because if we go back to ancient radio, uh, a VFO, stability at 14 megahertz, a pretty good one was plus minus 120 hertz. <laughs> so if I've got that sort of stability, I'm not going to see uh, a millihertz changes. <laughs> um, an ordinary crystal oscillator, just looking at the stability there. No, that's not good enough. I'm just going to mask anything, any of my millihertz. Uh, modern ham kit. Well, the spec is um, 0.5 parts per million over its temperature operation. Seven plus minus 7 hertz at... Um, 20 on 20 megs? No, that's not going to see millihertz either. <laughs> and even a temperature control crystal oscillator, um, plus minus 1.4 hertz, that's the sort of spec we get. Um, they can operate better than this, and I'm giving you worst case uh, type of figures, but I think you start seeing the technical challenge that we're facing. It's, this is, we're measuring very, very small frequency changes is what we're looking for. Now, FST4W, I've mentioned that this is what we're using. Um, it's a beacon mode, just like Whisper, um, but it's got some great advantages over Whisper for what we are trying to do. Whisper is a fantastic tool, it's a fantastic resource, and we've got millions and millions of spots we know a lot about propagation, we've learnt a lot about propagation, but we've, all we've learnt with Whisper is the signal to noise and when channels are open and when they're not open. We don't know how many hops, for instance, um, when we're using Whisper is, is in, on, on the paths that we're using. So Whisper's great, but although it's got a very narrow bandwidth, 6 hertz bandwidth, um, it actually has built-in tracking on the receive side. So you can't, uh, it's because it's designed to be received with relatively, and I say relatively, unstable equipment. Modern ham kit is perfectly stable enough, generally, if it's um, uh, reasonably up to temperature, to track Whisper without any problem at all. So, yes, your icon that I put there before, that will receive Whisper, no problem. Um, but it's unsuitable as such for uh, research involving the millihertz spectral spread, because um, the Whisper uh, soft receiving software doesn't give you these figures. Uh, FST4W beaconing mode, like the Whisper, is a, was a specifically designed to look at spectral spread. Now, FST4W was designed 
really only for LF and MF. So our lowest bands, 136 kilohertz and uh, 472 kilohertz bands, those band, at those frequencies, stability, not really an issue because you've got, uh, you've got 0.5 of ppm at, um, on LF, you've got 60 millihertz maximum spread. So we're down on the receiving side to the sort of stabilities that we need to be able to receive FST4W and actually get sensible spread, spectral spread figures from it. But I'm not interested in MF and LF. I've, it's not my, my scene. I want to look at HF. I want to look at signals bouncing around the world. And therefore, I want to go to HF. Well, let's just have a look at what the um, FST4W does as a protocol. Well, we've got, if you think 6 hertz whisper is narrow band, start looking at some of FTS4W. Uh, there's four modes in FTS4W. FTS4W120, which is a two minute, that's 120, 120 seconds, um, mode, which is actually very similar to whisper, similar sort of bandwidth that occupies 5.9 hertz, and tone spacing 1.46 hertz. However, there are much more long, there are much longer modes We've got the half-hour beacon mode, FST4W 1800, 1800 seconds. It sends exactly the same message, by the way, just very, very slowly. And um, with FST4W 1800, we have a tone spacing of 89 millihertz. That's the actual spacing between the tones and the spectral width, uh, the occupied bandwidth, is only 0.36 of a hertz. This is real narrow band stuff. <laughs> you can't get much narrower than FTS4W. And one thing we do get is signal to noise thresholds. If we look at for 50% decode probabilities, go very, very low with FST4W. We can get down to uh, this minus 44.8 dB signal-to-noise ratio. Now that is, I'll talk about that a little bit because it's, I always feel the figures for whisper and for uh, um, these narrowband digital modes uh, don't really give you the full truth about the signal-to-noise. But anyway, the slower you go, the less bandwidth you use, and the better the signal-to-noise threshold um, for receiving uh, signals. Just quick note on the digital mode signal to noise, which is kind of important. Um, we always talk about whisper and FST4W, you know, minus 32 uh, dB signal to noise for a 50% decode probability. Uh, it isn't. It is in an SSB bandwidth of 2.5 kilohertz. If you correct the bandwidth down to what it is, the real bandwidth that you're actually using, it's about minus 6 dB. <laughs> it's still good. I mean, heck, we're talking about 6 dB below the noise, but it's not. I, I just think we're getting to a point where we're saying all these digital modes are super and they can do wonderful sensitivities. No, you can't receive signals that are uh, 10,000 times <laughs> lower than the noise. It doesn't work like that. Okay, to run. Um, FST4W, simplest way actually, is to use our good friend from Whisper, WSJTX. Uh, um, and if you fiddle about with it and put a dummy file uh, in the home directory of WSJTX, uh, you can get a spectral spread figure. Um, and you can see here, this is me receiving um, OE8, OH, OH8 GKP. Uh, we started off um, at uh, 808 UTC. We've got 0.352 of a hertz spectral spread, so 352 millihertz. And then as the morning started progressing, my spectral spread that I was receiving from this station went dropped dramatically. 
And what's that actually saying to us? That's what we're interested in. This actually would appear to be that there was a multi-hop. I was receiving by a multi-hop, probably two hops, and I'd gone, the band had changed to be giving me a single hop. This is the sort of thing that Whisper would not tell you because if you look at the signal to uh, the SNR, you'll see that the SNR is minus 24, minus 28, minus 28, minus 24. It's actually much the same. So Whisper would not tell you that you'd gone from a single hop to a multi-hop, uh, multi-hop to a single hop propagation. Okay, so we want to go to um, exp expand to FST4 to W to the HF bands. Um, how are we going to do this? Well, where does SDR fit in in all this? Very quickly, we've been using the QDX, QRP Labs QDX. I'm just going to run over this extremely quickly because I'm conscious of time and also because I'm not trying to do an advert for QRP Labs. It's a great bit of kit. It's very inexpensive. Um, it's got an uh, inbuilt SDR receiver. Uh, it's actually an implementation hardware uh, uh, implementation of a superhead in software with a 12 kilohertz IF. It's got a TCXO for high stability. You'll get these notes if you wish to uh, look um, on the net, so um, I'm sure you can look in more detail as to how this goes. The stability of the onboard TCXO in the QDX is very good, but actually it's really only good down to about use on 20 meters for um, the FST4W120 mode. And if we start looking at the FST4W300, we start getting a problem. Um, we can't really use the, the longer modes. So the TCXO in this um, QDX uh, is not actually really good enough for HF research. Um, for our solution for this was to use um, GPS disciplined oscillator and these are now really inexpensive this is a commercial one that I've pictured here it's less than 150 euros so it's an inexpensive bit of kit and it's got an incredible stability this really does give you a stability which allows you to use something uh, the receivers down to most of these modes are now ca are available to you um, at HF using a GPS DO. It's also possible that um, an oven control crystal oscillator might do the, might do the job. Um, it's just that at the moment, um, from our point of view, it's actually cheaper to use a GPS disciplined oscillator. Uh, does involve some modifications on a surface mount board. So steady hand and a good eye are required. <laughs> uh, you have to actually remove the link to the uh, TCXO and um, actually remove a capacitor and feed in your external clock. Um, so there's some, a little bit of soldering is required to do this. Anybody who's building an SDR, by the way, I would very much like to say, please put provision for an external oscillator, reference oscillator. <laughs> it really would help us a lot. <laughs> Let's get on to some practical results. Um, the best way, and real, at the moment, to uh, get received data is from uh, using Whisper Daemon. Uh, we'll hear more about Whisper Daemon <laughs> here um, later today um, uh, because that's collecting this from uh, Kiwis predominantly at the moment, though I think that's going to change. There's some things coming along in that area. Um, and you can then start plotting received signal to noise and the spectral spread. And this is where things start getting interesting. Here we have, it's a fairly complex graph, but 
it's the sort of thing that we are beginning to get interpret for our results. So you see what we've got is on one side we've plotted the signal to noise. That's the purpley blue um, spread. And then we've got the, the black points, which are the spectral spread. So we can see here that we've got, when the band is open, we've got a very wide ranging mix of propagation uh, modes. It's probably going, some sometimes it's one hop, sometimes it's two hop, sometimes it's three hop, um, based on the spectral spread figures that we're getting out of this. Um, and then, in particular, when we get the band closing, we get some very oddball results when the bands open and close. We can see some uh, unusual mixes of um, uh, spectral spread and signal to noise. So this begins to say, what, how do we interpret this? And here we've done some contour plotting as well, just to give you the same idea. I'm conscious of time. I'm going to hop on quickly with this. The, we've looked at this using um, PyLab ray, ray tracing, which is a, a very useful tool. And this, looking at the same data that we had from the spectral spread, we can see that we've got um, a very lossy path uh, when we open and close the band. Um, and then we get a very strange effect with this chordal mode, or you can call it a Peterson ray, where we're actually refracting within the ionosphere itself, and we can get very long-range communications with a Peterson, Peterson ray. Um, and that will give you a very low spectral spread, because it's not bouncing that much. It's certainly not bouncing off the ground, which gives you a much higher spectral spread and it occurs when the bound opens and closes. Now, this is one that we've also got, um, G3ZIL to OE9GHV, not very far from here. <laughs> and um, this, there are times, this, this particular time of day, 1800 universal, this shouldn't work. <laughs> According to ray tracing, there should be no communications possible because it's in the dead zone. The signals from G3ZIL should be going right over. But communications are working. Why? And this is one of our results that we were very interested in, that we believe that this is a two-hop side scatter mode that we're seeing. And the, this is indicated by the differences in the spectral spread. Um, if we have a low spectral spread, we're getting straightforward single hop. If we're getting a high spectral spread with a, in this case, low signal to noise, that's indicating multi-hop propagation. And that can occur through side scatter. So what we've got here is a 3D ray tracing and we've, we've done this um, assuming that we've got reciprocal transmission and reception. So here we've assumed that we're transmitting from OE9GHV and also from G3ZIL. Where the two um, dots coincide, the maximum number of rays coincide, is probably where the side scatter is actually bouncing from. So signals are coming from one station off at an angle, probably well over a thousand kilometers away, then bouncing back to the other station. So we're getting um, a side scatter effect. This, by the way, because of the sensitivity of FST4W, you will not hear these signals. If it's normal SSB type of communication, you're very unlikely to have this as a communications mode. But it exists and it's a different type of propagation. Similarly, we've looked at, uh, in the States, 
um, an unusual two hop side scatter mode. This is from Santa Rosa um, in, in California. It's a 40 kilometer path. There is a permanent low level um, ground wave, but there are also superimposed upon that, actually giving us slightly higher signals at certain times of the day, a side scatter mode. Similar results available for um, the uh, transauroral, oval, and transatlantic paths. And further work, there's an awful lot to do in this area. We would, would like to do a lot more research with a lot more data points on different bands. We've been particularly looking at 20 meters and 40 meters at the moment. We can go with GPS DOs, we can go much uh, lower, uh, higher in frequency, much, uh, so there's a much more to be done. Um, and I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to finish. It's still very much a work in progress. Thank you very much. <laughs> So here from, from the live stream corner, <laughs> um, we have two questions, oh, well actually, from, from Evan, uh, P3ES, um, and he's asking, is there a separate setting in WSJTX to make the spectral spread visible? And the other comment is, my standard is 261, not showing its 0810 to uh, 22, oh, what's that? Oh, that's, that's a, that's, um, okay, doesn't matter. Uh, WSJTX, yes, the, there's not a config setting. Um, it's, <laughs> it, what you have to do is actually set a, um, a, f a dummy file. Gwyn can perhaps help here. If, if you're running uh, under uh, Windows. A blue microphone, please. Uh, it's okay, just uh, speak on. Uh, Point, the, 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 face the camera. Uh, take the camera. It, uh, the okay. take <laughs> control from back. Um, what you have to do is to make a dummy file, no content, just a file that exists. So if it's in Linux, it's touch and the file name plot spec. If you're doing it in Windows, you must not let Windows put a .txt extension on it by <laughs> itself. So double, triple check that it is only named plot spec. When you do that, it has to be in the directory in which you run WSJTX. Not in your home directory, in the directory in which WSJTX is run. And in that case, you would see on the screen, like Nigel showed, an mm. extra field on the end. Yep. That's in WSJTX. But the real way to do it is to use Rob Robinet software, Whisper Demon, and it'll all be logged for you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, for the explanation of this, what Jim <laughs> Griffiths, who is the second author of the paper, was Nigel Presents. So, uh, do we have more questions? No more questions. Yeah. Do we have questions from the audience? Oh. Yeah, 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 we have. Oh, that's nice. But I would suggest to leave it with these questions because we are already in the next slot. Yeah, those, yeah, those two yeah, questions. Yeah. Short questions, very short questions, please. So, uh, first let me say thank you for this interesting talk. Um, then I have basically two questions. Um, you said uh, a long, uh, low frequency, uh, you didn't try because uh, you have no personal interest in it. Uh, uh, do you think it's general? Not interesting for... Oh, no, 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 please. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> okay, fine. No, that's, that's, <laughs> it was, it's personal interest. Yeah, no, uh, could, sure. There could be some, some uh, principal uh, nope. things which makes it uninteresting in general. So, no, it, it's, so it's not was, stretching was the envelope. I li <laughs> we like to stretch the envelope here. <laughs> okay, so thank you for this. And uh, then uh, you uh, showed uh, how to fiddle around on the uh, board with uh, uh, external oscillator plugin. Yep. Did you consider uh, a software uh, compensation? For example, most of these GPS uh, modules uh, provide a pulse per second, which is very accurate. Uh, I, for example, made uh, 
some experiments with uh, a simple sound card uh, using the second channel uh, and uh, using the PPS, uh, I got uh, down very low just by software compensation. It's a good question. I think I'd like Gwyn to give me a hand with that one. Uh, uh, you, you can get very good performance if by very good you mean 30 millihertz. That is what the standard QESDR with its GPS out-of-the-box correction will give you. But you can see that 30 millihertz will tell you multi-hop, yes, but would it tell you that 10 millihertz from the UK to Canary Islands for those few hours? No, it wouldn't. So if you really want to do some scientific work, then the GPSDO uh, Phase-locked GPSDO is what is needed. One pulse per second would be good if you're interested in 30 millihertz. Thank you. I think we have another question. No, we, Marcus, over uh, there. It's, we are way into the next okay. slot. Yeah, so. but uh, I think it's very important <laughs> that now <laughs> the question will be uh, in action. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, Uli, uh, ON5KQ. I just want to emphasize that if you want to uh, do that work, you only need uh, 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 not only a very stable receiver, we need much more stable transmitters. The biggest problem at this moment is not having uh, enough transmitters. So in order to get more data, so better accuracy of the uh, analysis, we need many, many, many transmitters, otherwise it will yep. never be better. So that is, I think, yep. very important to know. Okay, thank you very yep. much. So uh, I think, Nigel, this was a very <laughs> important uh, contribution. And as you see, uh, it takes a lot of the solar cycle 25 uh, of attention. So thank you very much you. for that. And a big applause uh, for Nigel and Gwyn. <laughs>